Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. A young boy was consistently late coming home from school. His parents warned him one day that he must be home on time that afternoon. But that night, he arrived later than ever. His mother met him at the door and said nothing. Later at dinner, the young man came to the table and looked at his plate. There was a slice of bread and a glass of water. He looked at his father's full plate and then at his father. But the, his father remained silent, and the boy was crushed. The father waited for the full impact to sink in, then quietly took the boy's plate and placed it in front of himself. And he took his own plate of meat and potatoes and put it in front of the boy, and he smiled at his son. When that boy grew to be a man, he said, All my life I've known what God is like by what my father did that night. In this episode of Transformed by Grace, we'll take a look at a young man who also experienced grace at a dinner table. We learn what God is like by it as well. And you read through the Word of God, you sometimes come across a scene in a person, and you see an unforgettable portrait of grace. This is the case with an obscure man in Scripture who has a name that can be a real tongue twister, Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel 4.4 4 reads, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of David's close friend, Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of King Saul, Thus, of course, Mephibosheth was the grandson of King Saul. King Saul and Jonathan were both killed in battle against the Philistines, leaving the throne to be occupied by David. This is the tidings mentioned in verse 4 of 2 Samuel chapter 4. It was news of Saul's and Jonathan's deaths. Years earlier, David had made a promise to Jonathan. In 1 Samuel 20, David was running for his life from King Saul, who was trying to remove this threat to his throne out of his jealousy. David was destined for the throne, and his friend Jonathan pledged to help to save David, but asked him a favor in return. 1 Samuel 20, 13 to 15 reads, But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee, and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace, and the Lord be with thee. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off the ki thy kindness from my house forever. It was the custom in dynasties at that time that when a new king took over, the entire family of the displaced king were eliminated to remove the possibility of any future opposition or revolt. Jonathan asked David that when he became king and took the throne to please show his family kindness and to preserve his life and their lives and to take care of them and protect them. David agreed without any hesitation, and his deep, loyal friendship with Jonathan led him to willingly enter into this binding covenant with him to spare Jonathan's descendants after he became the king of Israel. 1 Samuel 20, 16 to 17 reads, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, and Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. After Saul's and Jonathan's death in battle, news came to the family of their demise. The family and servants had no idea that David had no intention of harming them when he became king. But knowing what normally happens in these circumstances, they ran to escape and to hide themselves. Of special concern to them was five-year-old Mephibosheth, 
because upon the deaths of his father and grandfather, he would have been the heir to the throne. And if David was intent on killing Saul's heirs, this boy would have been first on the list. When the nurse heard that both Saul and Jonathan were dead, she grabbed the boy who was in her charge and she fled to protect him, holding him as she ran. In her haste to run away as fast as she could, she apparently tripped and the boy slipped out, tumbled out of her arms and fell. She may have landed on top of him, we don't know, but the biblical record simply says that he fell as she ran. As a result of this accident, Mephibosheth's feet were damaged. The bones never mended correctly, and he was permanently disabled and lame. For the rest of his life, he was crippled. We find in all this how Mephibosheth had a life of hardship from a very young age. When he was only five years old, he lost both his father and his grandfather. He became lame from a fall, and he could not run and play like others his age. Not only that, but he had every reason to believe that he was the king's enemy and would be eventually killed. For around 15 to 20 years, Mephibosheth lived a life of insecurity in a distant land, in hiding, and in fear for his life. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 6 read, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amio and Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amio from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Regardless of who they were, David asked if there was anybody still living that should be the recipient of his kindness in Saul's family. Now servants scramble when kings request anything, so they act quickly and they immediately think of having David ask Ziba, who was a servant of the late king Saul. If anyone might know, he would, they thought. So Ziba is then brought before King David. David asked Ziba the same question. Ziba reported that he knew of a descendant and that Jonathan had a son still living who was crippled in both his feet. Notice that when Ziba mentioned Mephibosheth's name, he mentioned the problem with it uh, that he had. And that happens a lot in life, that when people's names are mentioned, their problems are equated with them and mentioned in the same breath. Like, have you heard from John lately? You know, who was the one who was in that terrible accident. Lucy's in town. It's a shame she has to raise those kids on her own, isn't it? I saw Frank today. He just can't seem to keep a job. Our circumstances and our past follow us. But when God speaks of the believer, he doesn't mention our past, our plight, our pain, or our problem. He lifts us up. He calls us his dear children, children of light, a saint, heirs of God, beloved of God, ambassadors for Christ, and members of Christ's body. You can see an insinuation in the response that Ziba gives the king. David asks, is there anybody left in the house of Saul that I might show the kindness of God? Ziba answered, yes, there is. Jonathan has a son, but he's lame on his feet. In other words, David, you better think hard about this because he would be out of place here in your court. He wouldn't fit in well here. He doesn't fit with your surroundings, with the people here in this beautiful palace. He has a serious disability. But in keeping with the kindness of God, Mephibosheth's condition did not matter. 
David was looking to show the unconditional kindness and love of God. And this was also about faithfulness, keeping his promise to his friend Jonathan, who had made David promise that he would show his family the kindness of the Lord. Because David was fulfilling this promise, David didn't ask how bad Mephibosheth's condition was, how he became crippled, if there were any other options in the family, any healthy fa family members. These words were never spoken. David's only response was, where is he? Where's the man located? Ziba answered that he was living at the house of Makir, son of Amio in Lodibar. In Lodibar, says Ziba. In Hebrew, lo means no. In Debar means pasture. This royal son of Jonathan was living in a desolate place in a remote barren location on the east side of the Jordan River, about 10 miles south of the Sea of Galilee. Mephibosheth had been hidden away in a barren place far away from Jerusalem with Machir, and the only one who knew his whereabouts was an old servant of Saul. It had been around 15 to 20 years, so being around 20 to 25 years of age, Mephibosheth had a family of his own by, his, by this time. We read in, uh, in verse 12 in this chapter that he had a young son named Micah. Mephibosheth had been hiding, now with a family, and the last thing he ever wanted to hear was an emissary from the king knocking at his door. But that is exactly what happened. Mephibosheth finally did get that knock on the door that he dreaded, as David's servant was dispatched, went to fetch him out of the house. We can only imagine his shock and fear at the sight of David's courier. After answering the door, Mephibosheth is told that the king requested to see him. And he most likely thought, well, <laughs> this is it. It's curtains for me. Mephibosheth is put in a chariot to be taken to Jerusalem. Arriving there, he is escorted into the palace and then right into the very presence of the king himself. Coming into the king's presence, this frightened man drops his crutches, throws himself down, falls on his face before the king, the one who had sovereign rights over his life. He did so fully expecting the king's wrath and judgment. David says, Mephibosheth, or are you Mephibosheth? And his response was, yes, I am Mephibosheth and your servant. Mephibosheth had no idea what to expect, and he expected the worst. Expecting death, he instead hears unbelievable words of grace from the king. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Bible Contrasts is a 28-page booklet written by Pastor David Adams. We see a number of dissimilar wordings within God's Word. Some have seen them as contradictions in the Bible. We prefer the term contrasts. The main reason for these differences is that God is setting forth two separate programs. The first deals with the earth and Israel. The other concerns the heavens and the church, the body of Christ. It was given to the Apostle Paul to lay out these differences. He is God's Apostle of the Gentiles. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.BereanBibleSociety.org To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.BereanBibleSociety.org Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. 2 Samuel 9, 7-13 reads, 
And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Mephibosheth's fear is understandable. So David's first words to him were, fear not, don't be afraid. The trembling guest was given assurance that he was bowing before a gracious king. The name Mephibosheth means he who scatters shame. And that is what David did for the young prince. And in fulfilling his promise from long ago, Jonathan's son would be honored and treated with kindness for the rest of his life. Mephibosheth expected the king's wrath, instead he got grace, unbelievable grace. Mephibosheth did not need to fear anything. He would be under David's protection from now on. David assures him of his kindness, telling him, I will surely show thee kindness. And in his kindness, he would restore to Mephibosheth all the land of his grandfather, Saul, the land that his father, Jonathan, would have inherited from Saul. Best of all, David insisted that he would eat at his table regularly with all his family as one of the king's sons. This is reiterated by David. It's repeated four times in these verses. Grace can be shocking, and grace can be confusing. And Mephibosheth is confused. He asked, what is thy servant? Who am I? The kindness he had received from the king was overwhelming him. He asked David, why would you look so favorably upon me who is no better than a dead dog? To be called a dog in the Bible, in Bible times, was to be considered a very low state, to be contemptible and useless. But being a dead dog took it to another level and was even worse. Mephibosheth humbly knew he had not merited this. He didn't deserve this kindness, and he could no way repay it. In response to Mephibosheth, David piles on some more blessing. Ziba is called before the king again. As Ziba had served King Saul, Ziba and his sons and servants were appointed by David to serve Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth. Ziba and his 15 sons and 20 servants were all commanded by David to work the land for Mephibosheth, to give him the food from it and its profits. The estate belonging to a king and belonging to King Saul would have been quite substantial. And it would have taken all these sons and servants of Ziba to work the land and to harvest its, its crops. Mephibosheth and his family moved from Lodibar to Jerusalem. And everything that David promised came true. And he continually ate at the king's table. Now think of suppers at this table with David in the years to come. It's mealtime. The dinner bell rings in the palace. Along come the members of the family and any guests. King David enters the room, takes his rightful place at the head of the table. Next, Amnon, David's oldest son, comes in, sits to the right of his father. Tamar, the tender daughter of David, enters next, sits beside her 
half-brother Amnon, handsome Absalom with his black as a raven flowing hair, enters and takes a seat next to his sister Tamar. This particular evening, Joab, the courageous warrior and David's commander of the troops, troops has been invited to dinner and he proudly walks in with purpose and takes a seat at the table. Later on, you could add Solomon to the picture, walking slowly in from the study with a scroll in his hand, brilliant, preoccupied Solomon, the heir apparent, slowly sits down. And then they all wait. And they hear clump, scrape, clump, scrape, clump, scrape the crutches and feet of Mephibosheth hobbling along. Smiling as he enters the room, joins the others, finds his place at the table, slips into his seat, takes his place at the table as one of the king's sons. And as it's been said, and then the tablecloth of grace covers his feet. Now I ask you, did Mephibosheth understand grace? You bet he did. And his story helps us to understand the grace of God. Do you see yourself in his story? First, as we rightly divide the word of truth, we see the main interpretation is for Israel, for the kingdom on earth. Believing members of Israel's program will be shown grace and kindness, will feast with Christ in the kingdom, find their place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. They will be blessed and highly honored by their king with literal land, literal servants and riches and be brought into the family of God and dwell in the kingdom under a mighty and gracious king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, we see a portrait of grace and principles of salvation in Mephibosheth's story. He reminds us of wonderful truths about the kindness and grace of God shown to us through Christ our Savior. Each of us carry the wounds of a fall. We have been crippled by the fall at the beginning, and we have been marred by sin. Living in this sin-cursed world, we are living in Lodibar, living in a spiritually barren wasteland. But we have been remembered by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and by him, like Mephibosheth, we have been called, delivered, elevated, blessed, and given assurance. By his grace and kindness, not by anything we deserve, Christ calls each of us to himself. When we respond in faith and trust him as Savior, we are given a permanent place in his presence. We are made a part of his family, the family of God. And he lavishes us with blessing beyond what we could ever imagine we all have crutches we all have been crippled by sin but Christ takes us just as we are crutches and all like Mephibosheth he scatters our shame and he lifts us up we bow in faith before a gracious God David took Mephibosheth from a place of barrenness and he exalted him to a place of honor he took a fearful, broken person from a hiding place and gave him an elevated station, welcomed him in his presence at his table continually. Likewise, when you trust Christ as your Savior, Christ takes us from where we are. If we are honest, fearful, broken, hiding in our sins, and he brings us to where he is, elevates us, and tells us that we are welcome in his presence continually. Like David with Mephibosheth, Christ, our creator, has sovereign right over our life, but we do not need to fear his wrath or judgment of eternal death. Christ tells each of us, fear not, and he gives us the assurance by pointing to his blood-stained cross and his empty tomb, and he tells the believer, don't be afraid. Christ gives each of us in the body of Christ an inheritance. But our inheritance is not a piece of real estate on the earth. 
it is an eternal place in, heaven, in the heavenlies. We are given a high position, seated with Christ in heavenly places, blessed with all spiritual blessings there. Ephesians 2, 5 to 7, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then notice that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Mephibosheth had nothing, he deserved nothing, he could repay nothing, and the same is true of us spiritually. But God, by his amazing grace, grants us his salvation, his heaven, his forgiveness, and eternal blessings that we can't earn, don't deserve, will never be able to repay. And our response to such grace should be like Mephibosheth's. What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? We were dead in our sins, heading for eternal judgment. And when we trust Christ, we are saved and blessed by the grace of God. And our response is like Mephibosheth's. Who am I? Why would you look so favorably upon me? I'm no better than a dead dog. Mephibosheth was constantly reminded every single day as he walked around that palace and he ate at the king's table that he was in this magnificent place enjoying the pleasures and blessing of this position because of grace and nothing else. And one day in heaven, in that magnificent place, as we walk around and see the sights we see and enjoy the pleasure and blessing of our exalted position in Christ in the heavens, we will look around and be reminded that it's because of grace and nothing else. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, Write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.